Tama tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Nama tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Nama tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the worthy one, the blessed one, the fully enlightened one. We pay homage to him and to the Dhamma. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. So I promised you that today we would go over the other half of this, uh, of the, the, uh, the whiteboard that was done. And I think this is good because, um, gee, I'm missing one person that I really needed to have here. <laughs> I really needed to, to have her come for this first part. We can we can go up at the top for a minute. So May, do you have the whiteboard? Can you put the whiteboard up? Okay. We'll do that first. Okay. Okay. So um good. This is great. Okay. So I need to I, I can I can move this over a little bit right there like that and I get to the edge that's fine that's great okay so you know if we go back uh, for anybody that wasn't here before um, the board is meant to be a capsule this board was meant to be a capsule and I do these freaky things every once in a while when I was living alone I would pull out the whiteboard set it up and or uncover the whiteboard <laughs> and then I would spend two or three or four hours just going through and trying to lay it out the way it is in my mind where I can keep the progressional line of exactly what it was that the Buddha was teaching as far as a something that could be used as a practice for us uh, a practice by us to be able to reduce suffering in in day to day living, and and the reason is because I think I felt that too many people were looking at the main objective of Buddhism, which was to reach the, the super mundane nibbana, become the arahat with fruition, and that sort of thing, and that that was the holy grail, so to speak. But I couldn't accept from the time I first got, got involved in Buddhism, I could not accept the fact that that was all there was, that that was the reason Buddhism came into being, that was the reason the, the whole structure kept going and everything. There had to have been something else in my mind that was given to the people that they used every day in their life. So looking at it in this structural way and getting excited about the one person, Siddhartha Gautama, who did this, and then the monks that followed him who also became Erhats and Erhats with fruition, is one way to look at it. And I think some people today, they don't understand why is the Sangha so important? Why is it really so very, very important to people who are Buddhists? We have, we, we have to remember that we would have nothing right now if it wasn't for them. We have to remember that they went through a huge line of history that they went up and down and nearly disappeared any number of times on a cycle that was going across like this and going like that and like that and like, whoa, and then coming back up slowly and then, whoa, almost gone and coming up again. And the history of it is it very just worthwhile to do the historical study of Buddhism. I've met some people that were deep historians in moving around with Bhante. He knew many people that were very deep, deep into the history of it. 
I got to listen to one historian who knew the absolute complete story of every person in his family and what happened to them, the, the, the Godama family. It's kind of fun. <laughs> he was explaining it to me while we were walking down a mountain. <laughs> and uh, at the bottom, I remember the one monk walked up to him and said, should you really teach your Dhamma while you're walking down the mountain? And he said, she's listening very precisely and I'm gonna keep teaching her. <laughs> and he taught me all these stories about every single member of the family. And it was, I never, I never knew because I didn't grow up in a Buddhist country. I didn't have these stories all told to me as I was growing up. The Sangha goes through tough times and easy times, goes through times when there's no disputes going on. But I think from the moment that the Buddha left and there was nobody there to stop the arising of pride and after a number of years, the competition between teachers was there before the Buddha came and during that time and afterwards continues on and the, the Sangha has always been a delicate matter. In each century or each time that there's questions of what's really going on, you have to say what's going on when you're in the United States. There's about 42 different kinds of Buddhism functioning all at one time. Not a lot of it without Sangha. It gets interesting. But here the question comes back, the thing that drove it forth, it made it such a miracle for me was something that was small. It was very detailed, but all those years growing up when I was young, when I was sick and had to have a tutor or be in the hospital a long time in the first young years. And then over the years, we always did puzzles and we always, played cards and we always played uh, board games, you know, and figuring things out, puzzles and stuff. When I got involved in this, I wanna know what in the world just happened to me. And what happened to me was this was unraveled to me. It was fed to me from the time I started learning the teaching with Bhante, Vimala Ramsey. And from that point, I, um, can you lower down toward the top just a little bit, May? Just toward the top a little bit. There you go, stop, okay. And so, of course, early on you learn Buddha Dhamma Sangha. You learn, there's the Buddha, there's the teaching and there's the Sangha that protects it, right? And then you learn the Dana Sila Bhavana. And, and Bhavana just means it's the, practice, the actual practice or development of something. And so the first two, Donna and Sila, generosity was there to open the person's heart and tapping into ways that you can be generous with people. And generosity means generosity of mind, speech, and, and body. The Sila was the virtue and the virtue worked hand in hand with the, uh, it turns out the virtue team was actually the virtue support team players. And if you look at number five below, you see support team players. The real name of that team is the virtue support team players because the virtue acted as a, uh, a five pointed umbrella and the five pointed umbrella defended us or protected us from the hindrances falling down on top of us, which is right below the precepts, you see? And so learning this virtue early though, very early in the system, when we go back up here to number four, where it says Donashila Bhavana, okay, okay. Learning it right there in the very beginning when you first come in the door is important because 
if you're protecting yourself, he doesn't really tell you in the beginning that you are protecting yourself from these other hindrances, lust and greed, hatred and aversion, sloth and torpor, restlessness, guilt and remorse and doubt. He doesn't really tell you that much, but you begin to hear it in everything that's being taught. You begin to hear the echoes of those things. And you come to realize that, that Sheila and the uh, Niwarana, the hindrances are, are inseparable. They're hooked together with purpose. So virtue is a shelter from these hindrances attacking you. And these hindrances don't just attack you in, in meditation. These are hindrances that attack you in life, aren't they? I mean, the lust and greed, the, the jealousy, the hatred, the competition, the, all, all this stuff, you know, hatred and aversion uh, to way we behave in aversion to a lot of things and immediately making assumptions and rejections and taking things personally. All this is this driving force between hatred and aversion. And then sloth and torpor, sleepy, dull mind. It should say sleepy, dull mind. If you're drawing it or something, you know, you should change it to sleepy, dull mind. Restlessness, guilt, and remorse is the way that we behave, go through. There's the three factors that we go through uh, when we steal something or do something awful and go away without confessing it to ourselves or forgiving ourselves or, or making uh, restitution for what we did. They a compound, and the favorite one of knowing someone's keeping something from you is when they're bouncing their leg, <laughs> bouncing their leg, and they're bouncing their leg in front of you. They're not telling you something like, did you really do your homework and practice those two things for the piano for me today? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, yeah, well, we'll find out. Okay, and then doubt is the is a real bugger because doubt comes in and just shadows everything but going back up donna and sheila the donna is uh the opening of the heart and the softening of the heart for what purpose for the purpose of function good functioning uh meditation is what you're preparing your heart for and sometimes we haven't been very generous sometimes we haven't been very kind sometimes we haven't been like that and the bhavana is a development of what? It's a development, always remember that it's a development of mind and a development of behavior patterns. Because when you develop mind in the direction that Buddhism is teaching you, your development of behavior patterns changes in keeping with that. So it's all tied together. So you move over to the next one that everybody is talking about. <laughs> is Sila Samadhi Panya. Sila Samadhi Panya. Now this Sila Samadhi Panya combines, the Sheila combines in this one, the virtue and generosity are combined in the Sheila. And the Samadhi is tranquility and insight evenly yoked together. And where we get this is from, I think I told you it's in 149 um, section 10, you can find the statement there, Majima Nikai number 149 in section 10. And you'll find the statement there. And if you look up, you want to play with this and say, well, weren't, weren't tranquility and insight two separate practices? Well, just for fun, you can take almost any of the texts and you can play with their indexes. Look up where tranquility or and insight are, and you're going to check the two places in the index, you'll find equal notations for usually find the same notations for the pages for tranquility and for insight. And then as you go there, you'll begin to realize after you go to 10, 20, you know, some suttas, you'll find that tranquility and insight are always connected as tranquility and insight. They're never appearing as just tranquility or just insight. It's interesting. It's interesting because of where we are today, where in many cases we have separated tranquility and said you try you practice tranquility separately and then you do insight. See, 
but this was tranquility and insight even yoked evenly together. If you don't understand, you go to a country fair and you watch two horses pull a sledge or you watch two bulls or you know of the big cows in India pull a wagon yoked evenly together where they're hooked together on the shoulders. They cannot be pulling unevenly or they will not be able to pull the wagon straight. Panya is the direct knowledge and wisdom. Direct knowledge and wisdom, when we look at that, direct knowledge means the same thing for our purposes in teaching you. It's easier to say direct knowledge it means knowledge and vision. Knowledge and vision was the method of teaching the Buddha insisted upon. He insisted upon this, which is interesting because it backs up the Kalama Sutta. And when we look at the Kalama Sutta, it's basically a, a sutta that is saying not to believe what somebody says to you, not to believe it because it's just sitting there in the text. When I read it, don't believe it, take it out, sit in your session, test it, see it for yourself. That's the only acceptance that he would give to a monk if he said, I understand. How do you understand? I know and see. But in the text repeatedly, it would say, but the Hindu teachers were saying, uh, the Brahmin teachers before were saying, uh, the Brahmin scholars would say, I know, but not I know and see. And when questioned, the Brahmin student in 95 had to confess to the Buddha. He'd never heard them say, I see it. But he says, but when I'm teaching, I'm saying, I know and see. And this is the basis for teaching you is teaching you to only know something and then believe if it, it, it if uh, believe it, if you have seen it and it operates correctly. So that's. Um, the, the know and see and the direct knowledge. Number three was tranquil wisdom insight meditation has two parts to it. Twim has two parts. Now, you know, the breath is for the purpose of breath. I was discussing this with someone the other night in the history of the, the meditation and everything. Previous to the Buddha, even the breath meditation was there, but the breath meditation of purpose basically in his teaching was for the immediate tranquility and stillness of the mind. So why? So that you could then proceed for insight and knowledge through knowledge and vision. That's why. So we, we are talking the same way as you hear some people explain. That's correct. We breathe until we're still enough to separate that away and then go and practice insight. But it doesn't have to be that way. That's we're just saying there's another approach with teaching you about as you're training you. Instead of telling you for six months, I want you to walk the same pace as the horse next to you. I'm going to hook you together from when you're little and train you from the beginning as a pair so that you will be the best pair that are pulling when you're pulling together. Next one is objective and balance. The objective was the teaching led to the mutual supporting arrangement between, uh, this is for the survival of the whole thing, the Buddhist Sangha, um, preserves and teaches the practice and the lay people supply the requisites to the monks so that they can keep on doing the research, practice, preservation and teaching of it for the people into the future. And even now there are certain texts that are still not, uh, you know, translated to the extent that modern scholars can study them. There's still a lot that isn't translated when you consider how many there actually were. So when you're looking at the, what does this do for the mind and what does it do for behavior, okay, in, in section three, um, you can see that um, it opens and it sharpens uh, the a person's ability without any tension to observe things and see things clearly. And it equals the highest potential, you're trying to reach the highest potential of mind when you're working with this meditation. That's the, the real 
objective for a lay person or anyone, a monk, is to reach the highest potential of impersonal observation, scientifically being able to examine something only to see what is essentially there. And nothing, realize nothing is impossible, nothing. You create a valuable, uh, productive somethings. Can you read that? <laughs> what did I say? Can't read it, I can't read it. It's coming right down a little bit more, yeah. You're, you're, it's a productive form of view, a productive form of observation so that you keep developing. Yeah, there you go. Productive. I, I can't get it. <laughs> um, you're living, the Buddha Sangha is preserved and teaches it. The, okay, I see this part. Okay. Up here, the kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity is what's happening. That's the part about your behavior. Now, so when you say if productive you creating, concentration, is it productive concentration? Productive. I it's just crazy. It's killing me. I can't see. I can't figure it out. I probably told you last week. <laughs> this is so funny. I can't see it. Okay, we're gonna give up on that one. <laughs> Go to the next, uh, the next the next one next to it, where Kilroy was on the side. You see where the Kilroy? Yeah. Okay. So this one is actually came before, but how does life really work? This is what's interesting. You can take a person off the street and, and, you know, they're not Buddhist and they want to know, why are you so happy? Why is your face so open? Why do you look so bright? Why do you have so much energy? It's just that then, you know, because I'm investigating something really cool. I'm, there's this, there's this man who actually, he became a Buddha. And they'll say, what, what are you talking about? You know, and I say, well, you know, there's this man. And he actually became a Buddha. But what it meant was, I'm just studying what does what did this Buddha find? What did what did he figure out? And if he did find it, did he leave the instructions for us to do it again today? And that's what got Bunty Vimala Ramsey really going because in 1995 it was uh Bodhi's translation that that tapped into this and he began to put together the pieces and he began to see that he really did find something that was uh, for the lay person and not just for the, the monks. And that, that I think really, he was asking the same sort of questions when he was starting out and doing this. So we move back over to the left side now of the board, all the way over to the left side, right? We said precepts are involved in protecting you from hindrances. And then the first night you're at a retreat, we want you to just get in touch and just start at the beginning. Who am I? What am I as a being? And as a being, I am simply a body feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. These five little components, five, pre five aggregates. And these aggregates means parts, okay? Of the, of the whole piece, the whole picture. And for the body, it runs from the head to the toes. And we, why do we have to say that? Because in the 1970s, and in this day and time, I can tell you in the 1970s, when we did calisthenics for exercises at the gym, it was all very different. And a lot of exercises and a lot of routines we learned and everything, we never put together that the head was part of the body. <laughs> We would be dancing and moving and throwing balls. And I, but we, nobody ever pointed this out so much about the neck exercises and stuff. They weren't there in the beginning. And so when you think about it that way, we, we, we cut ourselves off. Another way we cut ourselves off in society is with mental health. Okay. Now you can be ill and we can talk about anything that happens from here down in your body. You know, Sally Johnson, she has a broken arm this week. Very sad. Uh, we wish Sally the best. And we talk about somebody else who, you know, has a heart condition or a lung condition, stomach condition, circulatory disorder, almost anything you talk about in the body. But we weren't supposed to be talking about mental disturbances or depressive, depressive disorders or the person is having some type of dis-ease and if you take the word disease 
and start realizing it says no ease, dis-ease, and break the word in half, when you take it apart, you begin to realize, well, that applies to the whole entire body. And so it's important for you to remember that your body goes from the head to the feet. Another reason is because the Buddha figures out in the beginning, he figures out a mind-body connection that permeates this whole system. As we're talking about it, it permeates the system. And so then you have feeling feeling all you need to know. Now this, of course, I know there's Abhidhamma and we could learn 128 different kinds of feeling and that's okay. It's all right, it's fine <laughs> if you want to, but it doesn't need to happen. And the, we know it didn't need to happen back then uh, with the Buddha because it didn't happen and it didn't come into being for about 200 or 300 years after the Buddha was gone. And then all of a sudden Abhidhamma shows up. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> but the thing is to, to follow his program and be pretty successful at it and help yourself in life, you only need to remember a pleasant, painful, or neutral feeling. And if you don't, if you are not happy with the three, you can do with two, pleasant or painful. You can have pleasant, painful, neutral. But if you want, you can have pleasant, painful, neutral for ple pleasant and painful for the mental feeling and pleasant and painful for the body feeling that gives you five you can't stop there <laughs> except for the night when i read you many kinds of feeling that sutta you can have fun with and we can go much further but just for the sake of your practice operating and knowing where you are you only need to know pleasant and painful and neutral okay and then perception Perception, what it means is to perceive. And if you look up what it means to perceive something, means to name something. Name what comes up in your mind. That's your perceiving when you do that. So if we say the eye sees color and form, and it sees the color and form in this little bottle has a little yellow cap. It sees color and it sees the form, color and form, that's all. But then perception is what says yellow bottle. You see, it names it yellow bottle. So perception just names things. That's all you need to remember about it. And you can get through what you need to get through in the practice. And thoughts, thoughts, we just need to understand that thoughts operate in the mind the same way as your eyes function in, in, in uh, your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body function with the sense-based activity. So mind has a thought that arises and many times thoughts pop up in your mind and you didn't stop doing what you were doing and ask those thoughts to jump up, but there they are. The most popular one is you're driving home from work and the thought comes into your mind, I have to remember to stop and buy the milk. Otherwise, I'm going to be in trouble when I get home. I have to remember to stop and get it. But you didn't stop driving and then say, I need that thought. It doesn't work that way any more than you didn't tell your mind, your eye, I'm sorry, your eye, what to see when you open it up. You don't go to the door and say, okay, hear the birds now, hear. <laughs> you didn't do that. Or you smell the pie. I usually, my nose goes up when I smell the pie and I start walking towards granny's kitchen. <laughs> yeah, you know, but I didn't tell my nose to smell the apple pie. I can't remember that. If I just remember this, I can still smell apple pie. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, and then consciousness is cognizing. Consciousness cognizes. Just remember that. Consciousness cognizes. It understands. That's the part, understand. And that makes up the being. It's how the function of the, the parts of the being for operating in the brain and, and, and the six sense doors. You have six, so you put the six. It's important to learn that you have six external and six internal. Okay, and the 
external sense base is eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body. We mix, I mix this up a little bit. So if you want to fix it, the, the, um, I'm sorry, the internal, the internal sense base Let's correct this. The internal sense space is eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body. And the external sense space is forms and sounds and odors and flavors and the tangibles, sensations. Okay, so we, we, I need to fix it. I, I saw this the other day and I thought, how'd you do that? You know, but also we're talking about what's happening internally in the body and externally uh, for, for examination. And so the external world is experienced by the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. And, um, and then the mind is, the, there are mental functions for the for the operation of each one of those sense doors, but mind is where we go to if we really want to understand the whole internal system of the person and the whole operation together. I think that's the way to clear this up. Because I saw it last night when I went over and I thought, well, that's not quite exact. Okay, that's enough. Now, down here, we come to where we were going to go today. Anybody have any questions on how that's operating so far? Anybody have any questions? I can't see the board, but hmm? everybody's okay. All right. So when we come in today, show me who's here now. Can you show me who's here for a second? Totally. Okay, she didn't make it. I was hoping she would make it, but that's okay. I'm going to show her anyway, and she can read it tomorrow. <laughs> no, I have a friend who was here last time. Okay, pull this up again, the board. And now what we're going to do is go through the operation of how we experience our world. Now, the Buddha was really unique. A few years ago, and I have to pinpoint this for you, I think, so let's see, five, um, six, seven, eight, probably eight or nine years ago. It's amazing how long ago. In Sri Lanka, I was at the university in, in Nukagoda and Sri Jai Wardenapura University. And I was asked by the medical department to give um, a presentation about the meditation and what the Buddha was teaching. And there was an expert who was going to be giving the main talk. So they gave me 30 minutes and I had to present in 30 minutes. I had to present to them uh, in reference to what he actually discovered, what was so cool about what he discovered. Well, before this conference, this happens, about a few hours before we had coffee together and I met her and everything and we were sitting there and she just kind of made this remark, you know, that the Buddha wasn't such a big deal that modern science has gone far, far beyond. And, and uh, the example of this is, is neurocognitive science. And that was when uh, the remark just rubbed me the wrong way. And I went back to my cootie and my apartment where I was on the campus at that time. And I sat there and thought, you know, I'm just going to do this differently. I have 30 minutes. And he says, I don't care. You've got 30 minutes. You can do what you want. I said, I'm going to prove that the Buddha was the father of neurocognitive science. He said, what? <laughs> And I said, I'm going to prove it, you know. And so here's the thing. What the Buddha found in the basis of human cognition is dependent origination. But we don't exactly identify with it very heavily in Buddhism today because of what has happened to that whole story. Uh, the What he found were 12 links of how human cognition actually works. And when this is how you experience uh, how things operate and, the, 
And why is it important to us anyway? It's important because to understand how something is broke means possibly you can fix it. But if you don't understand how something is broken or how it actually happens that disturbs you, for instance, then you don't have very much hope of being able to change that behavior unless you can see how it's happening very finely. So how, how does it happen so fast? You think, well, how could we do that? Well, we live in a time of the movie industry. Ooh, the movie industry. And because of that, most of us know that the movies used to have frames and film, it's all a little bit different now, but in IMAX, it's still the same. And one of those frames is actually about this big. I was given one, I can't find it anymore, but it's about this big. And for an IMAX film for one hour, uh, the, the film turns on these great big, huge giant wheels that are down where the film operator is. And um, those two wheels, there's three and a half miles of film that run through in an IMAX one hour presentation. And each, each piece is like that big. It's the size of my phone. Actually, it's the size of this, size of this phone. See, that's how big one frame is. So these are zooming by, and that's kind of what's happening. You have this operation that is happening wicked, wicked fast, where inside your brain, this Six sense doors outside are operating and inside also. And suddenly contact happens. When contact as condition, feeling arises. When feeling arises as condition, craving arises. And when craving arises as condition, the next thing that happens is clinging. And when clinging arises, the condition is their habitual tendency library doors, they just fly open, the brain flies in and goes, takes one out, something that happened in the past to repeat the same reaction again. And then bingo, there is the birth of reaction. And then what happens from there is the suffering that occurs in the event because of them being taken personally with the Atta and such. So this has happened really fast. And we're not taught this in high school. We're not taught, uh, even though they found this back as far as the 1980s now and in um, the 90s, 1990s is when they first brought it into the college campuses for master's degrees in cognitive psychology. Uh, PhD level work, you see only, I think it was. And then, so now you have the neuroscience department, then you have neurocognitive science overall. And then within that, you have cognitive psychology. There was talk at one point, they would eliminate psychology departments on universities in a matter of years, hasn't happened yet, but they would just simply engulf that department into neuroscience because it all ties together. And it makes sense that they would do that as, as soon as they ended Freud, then we could talk about that. <laughs> you know. But until Freud left the building, it was kind of hard. But now Freud is old school, is what they're telling me. So, so now we go back, let's do it again, and let's look at what happens at number six. And this is where we find out, yeah, for sure. I mean, the Buddha gave something to the people that they could actually play with. Because if you watch what happens, a person screams at somebody and the ear, we'll use the ear, um, the ear, that's an eye, but what can we do? <laughs> you know. Okay, so an ear hears a sound and somebody screams something at, and the feeling is, that comes up is a painful feeling. It whips right up and the tension in the body changes slightly. And then you hear inside, there's an I don't like this mind. And that's the craving. I don't like it mind. 
You see, you have, I like it. I want it attachment that flows in one direction. You have, I don't like it, don't want it, and a, a pushing sensation to make it go away in the other direction. Either way, you have a, a push or a pull that is relatively the same amount of pressure and is based on what? I, me, it's based on me. So I don't like it mine. And then with I don't, that uh, craving as condition, clinging comes up and clinging, it happens very fast. And some people decided, well, maybe we should just make it one little link and call it grasping. Well, I looked at that, but grasping is a, a description of how you feel in both craving and clinging. That's true. But these are definitely two different things. And when I watch people, they, def they keep saying to me, no, really, it is two different things. Because it's the, it's the punch of, I, I like it. You can feel the jerk of this hit with craving. And then you experience the mental proliferation. Proliferation means it's just like all oh, the thoughts of stories and uh, of why I like or I dislike the feeling that came up. And it just runs in your mind like crazy. And then very quickly, you choose a reaction subconsciously almost choosing subconsciously because whatever the familial thing was that happened in the occurrence whatever was uh, it it felt like it hurt you, you heard the sound the same or the touch the same or the color the same or whatever triggered this you see happened very quickly and goes in to a computerized uh, filing system in habitual tenancy library. <laughs> and it pulls out one tiny card that has a reaction on it that you're just gonna replay again. So basically in the computer age, we would have to say that you are caught in looping, looping in your life. And in relationships, this is important because if we have a difficulty in a relationship and we keep a little journal about it for a week or so, whenever we're having difficulty with that relationship, if we look closely at what was happening, is there something familiar that's happening in each one of those incidences that is identical? And if it is identical, well, that's the looping that's happening, okay? And the looping, the looping is happening um, to the place where you're just gonna play it again, the reaction. And that's where the birth of the reaction occurs. And that's the re repeat looping, play it again. And then what happens is the suffering. Now, there's something that is called, um, we've, we've gone through this type of thing. And I've given you a seven link chart for you to, uh, I don't know if you have a picture of one of those or not, the seven link charts, the seven link charts. I don't know if you have a picture of it in your file somewhere, but the seven link chart is contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth of reaction, and then the suffering, okay? That's your seven link chart. And that's kind of, that is a picture of what's happening to you very, very fast. And you're slowing it down. Now you're beginning, if, if you recall the incident, you can I start to identify these, but, there's no chance for you to identify these pieces if somebody doesn't point them out to you first. That's the trick to this whole thing. This should be common information for the high school, uh, for the health class, for uh, maintaining balanced mental activity and everything. It should be that you have this kind of information and understanding what's happening in an event when it happens. When you hear something or you see something or you smell something or you touch something, you see, or um, the body feels a sensation happen suddenly. It triggers a memory. Now, is this PTSD? Yes, this is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, yeah because that's exactly what's happening. There's a sudden trigger 
that's occurring and we're showing you what to do with it. The thing not to do with it is if it's triggered it, that you stay with that. The thing is to train the mind when the trigger happens toward it, to trigger it toward a wholesome move immediately and to check your surroundings very quickly to verify I'm not there, I'm here and to go from the negative, from this horrible incident which happened that comes up in this memory to I'm safe, I'm here, I'm in the right place. Okay, this is what's real now. This is checking the essential next to the unessential. When we teach retreats, we teach you a line every single morning is included in your uh, morning service that what is important is for us to learn to learn the essential, to see the essential as the essential and to see the unessential as the unessential. This is in the Dhammapada, it goes like this. In the unessential, we imagine the essential. That's a problem. In the essential, we see the unessential. That's a problem. And anyone who entertains such wrong thoughts mixed up like that, never will realize the truth of the present time. Okay, what is essential we regard as essential when you're in something in the present time, you're here now, and you're only seeing that only alone. What is unessential we regard as unessential. I'm going to ride my bike after the piano lesson in the park with my friends. <laughs> That's unessential right now. Who, the one who entertains such right thoughts realizes the truth and can get the A plus in the piano class, ha, <laughs> okay, that's how it works, okay, all right, let's go back to the chart, <laughs> anybody got any questions, let's do this a minute, anybody got any questions on the chart um, as it, as we did now, okay, here's your seven chart, seven link chart, when we give you the seven link chart, we are showing you the breakdown for each one of these definitions, are here and we are giving you these to kind of keep with you. You can shrink this down and put it onto just a little uh, five by seven card and keep it with you. You can keep it around, you see? So the birth of the reaction, birth is to one single event. You make the, the birth of the reaction and then there's the aging and death, sorrow, uh, pain, grief, lamentation, despair that happens over here. And that means specifically uh, in terms of one event is what you are trying to examine at a time. And the thing to remember about this too is that when a feeling comes up, feeling and emotion are two different things. So somebody says, well, that's not true. And I said, well, feeling is just a physical feeling, physical, mental feeling, okay? And emotion has a name. So if we think of it, your emotions are like anger and jealousy and um, just a whole bunch of these, you know, depression, the feeling depressed, uh, the emotion depressed anger, they all have names. And so if you figure them out, but, emo, but the feeling is just the immediate piece that comes up is just pleasant or painful. Okay, we can go back to the other, other one now. Okay, the other chart. Mm -hmm. Okay. And go back to the other chart. Yeah. <laughs> So here we are down here. Now let's go over, I, you, you probably did already. Wait a minute, I have to move my pictures just a little bit, okay? You see what I did over here is this loops around now. What happens is you're moving in this direction. There's all this tension that builds from contact, feeling, and craving is where everything starts to change. And that's where everything on your chart becomes red, and that's like, I call it the red zone. That's where all the concern is for the suffering. And it happens that what changes at the point of craving is I, 
come into this. I enter into it. And when I come in, this Atta has shown up. And I like, I want, I don't like, I don't want this opinion thing. And then clinging all the stories about why I like it, why I don't like it, why I this, I that. And it's all getting very personal. So you see this driving force happens here. And then what happens is, is you go into suffering at the end here. Taking things personally leads to the Atta growing and that is suffering. But if you were seeing things impersonally, that's Anatta that's not going to bring about the suffering. You will easily learn how to let things go by. But what happens when we turn around on this thing and go back, this is called transcendental dependent origination. So what we're doing is we are going to transcend, which means go above, transcend dependent origination, by how are we going to do that? We are going to go to a temple and knock on a door and find a monk and have them come on out. And uh, they're going to maybe invite us in. And uh, another monk might say, put your faith in the fact that the Buddha found something. And to do an experiment, investigate what it happens if you become a meditator and you start to do meditation. You say, what's meditation? Well, here you are in Washington, D.C. I was in Washington, D.C., full of energy like this and stress and tension and oh, pushing and pulling and everything on me. And this monk says, sit down on the floor. Sit still. Be quiet. <laughs> And then he says, close your eyes. And then he gives me instructions to do breathing meditation. Let me tell you something. When I did that the first time, and afterwards, after that class, went back to the apartment and went to sleep. I fell asleep like those little babies look like, you know, asleep in their little strollers, you know, and they're so totally asleep and relaxed, you know, and I slept so well. That night, I thought I had gone back to just being a baby and, and sleeping like that. It was just amazing to sleep, totally rested, but just starting to meditate what happens to you as you learn, you start to training this way, just allowing yourself to sit there and just breathe. If you're doing breathing meditation and you haven't done TWIM, if you would take your breathing meditation and just, just breathe, but don't pay any attention to the breath. Do not put your attention on the breath. There's no thing in the instructions that tells you to concentrate on the breath in Anapanasati Sutta. It says, we, I understand I breathe in long. I understand I breathe out short. You see, it doesn't say I concentrate on my breath and watch while I do that, or I absolutely concentrate on the breath. Nothing is there like that. That came from a time before the Buddha snuck in and started happening again. We don't know how. But it didn't come from what the Buddha said about Anapanasati. He just said, follow the instructions. Okay. And then as you're doing that, tranquilize the bodily formation. There's no formation of breath. Breath is air. Breath doesn't have a body. Breath is just air. So there couldn't have been a description of tranquilizing the air as the form as the tranquilize the bodily formation of air no 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 just tranquilize the bodily formation and when you do that with your breathing when you do that with your breathing the breathing practice starts to go wide open inside allows you to start watching it only moves slower in the overall development of the student 
because it doesn't have the advantages as of Brahma Viharas have to changing both the mental and behavioral aspects of the student. It only can help a little bit physically, it can help physically, and it can help some mentally, but it cannot change the um, behavior of the person, except very, very, very slowly in progress. So everything that we're told about it is true. It could take you a year to get to a first jhana or a second jhana, maybe five years or 10 years. Okay, it's fine. But I'm only going to be here this long, <laughs> you know, and right now I want to see what I can do for my life right here and now. And Brahma Viharas is more aimed at that because it's saying when you're practicing metta, this is going to change, then karuna, that's going to change, then joy, that's going to change, and equanimity, that's going to change. That's a program. And that's a progressional line. And that's where people start really changing. And that's what we need in this world, really need. So let's do it. You take faith at the door, you start meditating. What's the first thing that happens to you when you meditate? Relief. Relief is what happens. And when the relief happens, this is Pomojan, when the relief fades away, joy will start to arise. The joy, as you, uh, the relief is the first, and you might stop and go for a walk. When you come back and start practicing again, you stay open and relax. The joy comes up, that's PT. When the PT fades away, if you just always remember, whatever comes up is not a present for you to keep. It's not, it's not a piece of candy to keep and it's not a piece of something to keep. It's something that comes up, enjoy it while it's there and understand anicca, it's going to fade away. But the trick is this line of development, when joy fades away, tranquility arises. And when tranquility fades away, happiness arises, sukha. So the Kiti, Pasadi, and Sukha are a line that is secure. That's real. It always works that way. If you just relax, you can experience it happening. And then you stop again. Say you take a walk. And when you come back, you start again. And at that point, your collectedness is in a productive position. Profitable concentration is a a uh, profitable uh, position for your collectedness. Just right, your mind is collected. You're in, how does your mind get collected? You give up interest outside and put your interest just right here and you start practicing right here with your interest in one thing and then it's collected. That's the collectedness, okay? So you collect your mind on one thing as you come back, and that's just an interest in seeing what happens next. That's the invitation for deeper inspection, inviting deeper inspection. Do you remember I told you in the beginning, one thing that did survive and didn't seem to change through, not just through the Theravada line, but appears in other lines as well, was the statement that this is, was originally something, some of them changed it to say, um, easy to understand for the wise, but that for the wise thing is added on. It was easy to understand. It was immediately effective here and now, meaning in the present time as you're practicing, you're going to experience immediately effective in uh, here and now. It was, um, let's see, um, it was um, hmm. immediately effective here and now, inviting deeper inspection, basically four pieces, inviting deeper inspection. And that's the part I just told you, where here, when your happiness at that point, you're wanting to go back and your collectedness, when you do the collectedness, 
um, collectedness comes in right there and the collectedness is just right. What you happen, you reach a point that should be on this line, but it isn't here. And what it what should be there is between collectedness and disenchantment, okay? There is a thing called, you reach an understanding of how things actually are, of how everything actually operates, okay? You can go back in your notes if you've been with me for a while here and you look at the Upanisa Sutta and you'll find out what it is that's right there. The full complete understanding of how things actually work. That means that all of a sudden it hits you. Everything works like we're showing you in this line of, of, uh, of human cognition or dependent origination, or you can say dependent co-arising. Everything always operates exactly the same. There is no deviation in human beings. They all have this in common. And when you have the sukha happening, and then if, when you let go there, you come back and you start practicing, your practice gets perfectly balanced, not too tight, not too loose in your concentration, perfectly collected, okay? Then you, you're seeing things, seeing things very clearly, exactly how they work. That's this, um, this part that's not here in this chart. I left it out. I don't know why I did that. And when you come back and practice again, you slip into a depth of what is called pure mind. And pure mind is the spot you can, you can experience pure mind a couple different ways. This practice allows you to experience the reality or truth that Nibbana or Niroda actually does exist. A point, a neurota is a point of absolutely no craving at all, no craving and tightness. And where do you experience that? When you look at the steps in your six R's, you recognize something's pulled you away. Okay. You recognize it and then you release it. And then you relax and then you smile as you're coming back. So recognize, release, and then relax. And at that relax, just there before you smile, there's a tiny, 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 little, tiny, 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 dot, tiny little dot. And that spot, there is absolutely no craving at all. It is Niroda. You are seeing, experiencing a mundane Nibbana. That's a mundane experience of the complete emptiness. You see? So what happens with students who are practicing for a, a while and they're getting up into uh, one and a half, two, two and a half hours pretty comfortably. They'll come running to you saying, oh my gosh, I thought this was all just a practice. I didn't know this was real. <laughs> I went to Bonte and I was pounding on the door. I didn't know this was real. I just, it was a game. I mean, I was, so, I was follow instructions. I just keep going. He said, what's the matter? I said, this is real. Cessation is real. He said, well, what did you think? I was trying to send you to experience something all these years and it didn't even exist. And I said, well, no, but it seems so. He said, he said go away, go work. <laughs> go back and sit and you know I was laughing because I mean I was so shocked that it really did exist I was ready to surrender to the idea it was hypothetical that it was not actually theoretical and it's not it's theoretical because all you have to do is do it to see where the theory goes and then you'll experience it but here he's got it down to the six steps Six tiny steps. How can it be like that? He gets it down to the six steps. And it shows you right between 
the relax and the smile, there's a tiny little spot and that's your pure mind, pure, pure mind, nothing but pure mind, see? Now we try to get you into a deep state, uh, help you to get as far as a state called quiet mind. And when you're working with quiet mind, you're very close to being able to fall into a state that expands this open place, this pure state of mind. And what is it about this pure state of mind? To experience that pure state of mind is absolutely remarkable because if we experience it in an extended way and then come back out of that, our sense doors kind of like explode. I mean, it's like they're, they're uh, part, I think um, part of this, it has to do with the um, fact that um, most of the, most of the issues that we're thinking about are of the past. I'm always saying that to you and most of the difficulty you have comes from the past and your um, things that your reactions and everything, they are sourced from the past. And so if we were able to turn around uh, the way it worked, hold on just a second, this is driving me crazy. Um, I have to change this. How do you do that? I don't know why. I don't know why. Oh, here, just a second. There, there. Okay. First of all, if you are, um, I knew that was funny. It was just going all over in my mind. First of all, if you have a problem with um, reacting a lot, and you watch it closely and keep track of it. Write notes at the end of the day. I, I did this with this person. I was talking and then, you know, this happened and I went in this direction and you start recalling what it is. Look at what it is. It's going back to when you were six years old and your mother did something the same way and you reacted and now you're reacting with a lady that looks similar to your mother or something like that. It's a crazy thing the way this all works inside the brain. So what happens to us in cessation is we are actually, we are actually, um, everything is ceasing that was past and future it, that is in your brain at all. It's gone. Suddenly it's gone. And there's just no pressure toward the brain at all from either side of future or past. So there is this clear mind space. When that's happening, it affects your sense doors. It affects the eyes and the ears and the nose and the tongue and sensations in the body. It affects everything. We know this from other types of, uh, of teachings that existed uh, concerning uh, meditations, different kinds of meditations. But here he has it all, putting it all together. Where did you go just then? You just rebooted your brain. You just restarted the computer back to the original factory default. Well, you just rebooted your brain to the point where you suddenly could see absolutely clearly here. It's, it's just amazing experience to go through this. And then how long does it stay? It stays as long as you take care of it. You have to know what it is when it happens and how you're gonna take care of it is, can you keep going and keep developing it more and more? Yes, you can. That was the advantage of being the monastics. But can the lay person experience this? Yes, they can. But it's a little bit harder because we're also handling everything in life and handling just everything. And people would say to me, well, you know, 
why aren't you this instead of that after so many years? And I said, well, because, you know, I stopped a few times and built a center and did construction and cleared the forest and handled heavy equipment and did a whole bunch of things for a, a monk where nobody else would come and leave their other life and just travel and do this with that person and do all the attending stuff for that person, as well as what I was training at the same time. So it, I have no idea what I could have done if I hadn't been doing everything else besides, I don't know. But I can tell you this, this is real. This is not a fairy tale. He really did find a way to restart the brain. And then how long, how much it time it takes you to take care of it is the story of coming to the hospital and having the baby with the doctor, with the nurses, and then they don't go home with you. You go home with the baby. And what you do with the baby is entirely up to you. So you can't blame it. It didn't work. It didn't stick or anything like that on anybody. But yourself when you went home from the retreat and decided to go from there. You don't have to stay in retreat for this to happen. You don't have to only think of it as something that is done in retreat. That is sort of sad that this happened to be developed in that kind of story. That is not real because forest monks simply went into the forest and they, they left and, and they took care of it themselves that way. But to put it into that framework, that's unfortunate to make us think that it's not available. And so much of this changes your life without going, uh, even without going all the way through one time, you people are changing so much here and most of these guys have not gone through. They've done really well. They can sit two hours. They can, some of them sit two and a half hours, but they never quite get up to three. And they um, are always so busy with their work because they counsel by phone people all over the world and help them, you know, that they can't continually do this. But if they continually could do it, they could certainly go a long way because they're so dedicated to what they're doing right now. So it's real interesting how we're going to handle this in modern times. But just coming to this one place is where this all happens, where you get your balance of concentration and collectedness. And then right there, um, understanding the true nature of how everything actually works. And that means understanding the impersonal nature of anatta. That means fully completely understanding how the suffering is operating and how anicca is operating. And it's also understanding that anicca is not always our enemy. Anicca doesn't have to be our enemy. Anicca has been dressed in false clothing. How's that? Anicca has been put across in the dark drape of, you know, the guy who comes and does something awful. But Anicca can be our friend, can it? We've tried to explain that because if you rest easy in when something is going absolutely nuts around you, it's going crazy around you. If you take a breath and relax a little while and open your eyes, it's all changed. Everything changes. And if you believe everything can, can change, then you can rest in the idea and Nietzsche is functional with everything on the entire face of the earth. Everything is always in a flux and it's always moving and always changing. So that's a good thing. So in Nietzsche, Dukkha, Anatta was very important to understand, but when you learn these seven links here and you start following them carefully of how everything's working, you begin to see Anicca Dukkha Anatta like you never saw it before. You do. And you're really a shock when you do a shock. So another support system that exists beyond the, uh, beyond the one that we're talking about, okay, 
we're talking about how this is working with how every individual event is, is happening on the seven links. And then we're showing you how it moves all the way in your development through collectedness to the uh, understanding the nature of how everything actually works. And then you, you're disenchanted with things uh, around you and you just wanna do this until you can find out how far it goes, dispassion, liberation, nirvana. But then there's another support system. So the first support system was um, was um, Dana Sila Bhavana. The second one was Sila Samadhi Panya. Um, and then now you learn this, this is here to support you for knowledge. And now you have the harmonious eightfold path. And that has per permeated through this whole entire thing. The eightfold path is really something. And it's harmonious. It is trying to get you to a place of real pure harmony where everything seems to work together and smoothly. So how is this working? How did he give you this path? First, he talks to you about a harmonious, uh, you know, right view, and that's harmonious perspective. The perspective is how you see the world, how you see life. When something is occurring, the moment you see what's occurring, how do you, what is your view? Do you take it in a wholesome way or you take it in an unwholesome way, okay? And um, you, wait just one second, I have to get some water. Just a second. So when you're talking about the path, you're talking harmonious perspective first. That's how you see life. You meet people who the moment they come in here, I say, oh boy, this is gonna be the end of time. <laughs> Next person walks in and says, wow, this is gonna be a challenge. Yeah, you see a situation, identical situation happens to two people. And then one person comes, it's the end of my life. Everything's over, I'm done. I might just well give up and go home. The other person walks in and says, wow, there's nothing here. If this is where we're gonna stay, this is great. We can make it any color we want. We can design it any way we want. You know, this is gonna be exciting. I'm probably gonna learn a lot about myself by taking over this space. What happened here? What is the difference? They walked in the same building for heaven's sakes. I've watched people, you know, get a truck, you know, on a farm. And one of them talks about nothing about except how bad the truck is. But the other one, you get in the car to ride back to the farm with them from town. And they're saying, isn't it great we have a truck now? <laughs> you know, we, we don't have to go back and forth to carry all the equipment. Now we have a truck. So to, to, it's how you decide to see things. And you are in control of your personal view and your view is everything. If you have a personal view, you take things very personally. Everything is heavy for you. But if you take things less personally, then your perspective is different. It's an impersonal perspective and things get lighter very quickly. And so what we say is harmonious perspective is an anatta perspective not atta perspective, but an anatta perspective, okay? So instead of being judgmental and jumping in, we're gonna look at things first. Next one is imaging. And this one was right thought. And right thought just boils down to this, the thoughts you carry in your mind. What you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind. That's what the text tells us. And I think it's in 19, the way that we talk, I think. What you think and ponder on, that becomes the inclination of your mind. The only person who can control the images you keep in your mind is you. So that's pure, happy, wholesome images or ugly, downtrodden, oppressing images. It's up to you. 
communication, all right? Harmonious communication used to say just right speech, but when we looked at that in life, how do you communicate with people? If you hold your body position, your body language is extremely important. If you're not paying attention to your body language, your body language can tell someone to come over and sit down with you and have a nice conversation, or it can tell somebody to go jump in a lake. <laughs> Don't come near me. You know, your body language can tell your children they better come in pretty quickly or else there's going to be trouble because the dinner is hot now on the table. I need you to come in now for dinner. You know, mom puts her arm up on her hip and says, hello, it's time to come in. You know, they're going to come in. They were asked a few times before, but now they're really going to come in. Communication is um, the harmonious communication is remembering your thoughts, your words and actions communicating and position the body and included in the body language. So you have to have that included. Then the next one is the movement of mind's attention. And this one used to be right action. Now we do, it's perfectly true what they taught about right action before in everyday life. It's perfectly true. We're not contradicting that at all. We're saying in reference to your, spe the specificity here is your practice of meditation. Um, it's really important that you are aware of the movement of your mind's attention. And if you train yourself to watch the movement of your mind's attention, then you basically become in control of everything. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Everybody comes here to learn how to get control of their life. And the Buddha says, you have to let go of all control in order to see how everything works. The first thing he tells you, and you think he's crazy. And then after you start watching the interworkings of how everything is operating, when you come out the other end, you become in more control of your life than anybody else because you understand how things are actually working. Can we move this? Oh, let's see. I can, I can move it. You don't have to move it. I can move it. It's okay. All right. The next one is there harmonious lifestyle. Now, the reason Bondi changed this, and um, he used to explain it one way. I explain it. I'll tell you how I explain it. I've been around in, in uh, through Sri Lanka and a lot of places in India where the houses are so tiny, you know, and you want to have a space for your altar in your house with your family, a place to uh, sit together to practice, but a place where you can be private and be by yourself. And so when I say uh, harmonious lifestyle, you're looking for setting up the place where you live and the place where you work and the kind of work you do and everything. Everything was correct, they said before, but we're carrying it further than that. If you're trying to develop your mind as well as just your life in the community, then what you want to do is make sure there's a way for you to have a place to be by yourself. And it can be a tree where you put a bench under the tree and you're there by yourself. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Where you have a space where if you put a one woman, they simply, whenever she, you go in the house, if she has a scarf over her head, don't bother her at all. Don't disturb her. She wants to be alone. She's in prayer or she's meditating. So some place where you can make this happen has to be part of your life so you can continue to develop your practice. The next one is number six. And six, seven, and eight are right effort, and they were mindfulness and concentration. Okay, and what we did with those to put the harmony aspect into this harmonious practice, we're telling you right effort is what we're teaching you. The four steps of right effort are to recognize when you have an unwholesome mind state in your mind. Number two, release the unwholesome mind state. Number three, bring up a wholesome mind state to replace it. Number four, keep the wholesome mind state going and create more wholesome mind states like that and you'll change your life. That was what it was in the text. So the only place we're adding a tiny bit of toning to this tuning, how you do these four steps. Listen, 
You recognize when the unwholesome mind state is there. Second one, you release it and you relax your head, which relaxes your whole entire body. Remember that automatically. Third one, bring up a wholesome, which is the smile as you return to what you're doing. And then repeat this process again and again. What is the key uh, point they found in um, neuroplasticity of the brain? The neuroplasticity of the brain is when you are, uh, neuroplasticity means you're retraining the brain. If you look, um, let's see, the way we change, well, wait a second. Um, I'll show you that in a second. Just that's, that's right effort. The seventh one is observation and that is mindfulness. Okay, harmonious observation is mindfulness and you all understand that our form of observation skill we're learning with the Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation is very specific because it has a way of reminding you, it reminds you to do the six R's if you start to feel the tension and tightness. It reminds you to do all six of the steps each time and keep it repeating. And you'll see why we repeat it in just a minute. And the eighth one, the last one of these is the collectedness. It was concentration, right concentration. And you always need to reach a profitable level of concentration, not too tight, not too loose. Okay, and when we go back on the board to the other side, we go over to number eight. Okay, and when we start reading at number eight, the how does this change us? The way to change is you change your perspective. That's the first one over here. View controls everything. Your view is the driving force behind your meditation, keeping it going, how you see the world, how you interact, everything works with view. You do that by purifying your mind and retraining your brain. And when you're retraining your brain, if you look underneath, the reference point is neuroplasticity. The neural plasticity of the brain was discovered about mm, late 1980s, mid 1980s. And this is what helps us to stop reacting and start responding. Whenever you want to change a habit, you just let go of the old habit and you always replace it with the new one. And eventually the old one dries up and falls away because it isn't being fed anymore. What are you learning? Number nine, that pain is inevitable in life. We cannot stop the pain from happening, but suffering is optional. That's what we're learning. Suffering is optional due to learning the proper knowledge and wisdom of how things, everything, everything works. We begin to learn how and Nietzsche is the flow of everything. So if we understand how it works, we can let it go, relax, smile, and come back and replace it and keep going in a positive direction. The Buddha discovered in number 10, nothing happens to you. Everything is happening from you because of a Nietzsche, nobody is stuck anymore. I used to hear so many people tell me, but I'm stuck, I'm stuck. Nobody is stuck. And if anybody told you you were a victim, the only thing you were a victim of is a system that never told you how this works. That's the only place you, we were victims. We have been victim of a denial of information as it's being discovered within our time. That's what I think we have been a victim of. But everything is changing all the time. And so relax and enjoy what's happening, you know, get more excited about it and understand you do have control over a lot more than you think you have control over how to practice whenever we're at 11, whenever tension starts to come, forgive it. Just forgive it. Just forgive it. That's it. Why? Because why not? You know, it's like you're over there on the Gaza Strip and I'm in Israel and you yell at me, I really hate you. I hate you. I forgive you. Or I can shoot back. What's the choice here? Forgive them, forgive them. But everybody needs to just forgive each other. 
we need to erase, you know, this problem is people are not taught what we're teaching you about. If they were taught what we're teaching you about, they could not sit down at a peace table without, you know, coming out with some kind of result. But they can't come out with a result from a peace table because they don't understand how war is operating. And what I'm explaining to you is not only how peace comes to be, I'm explaining to you how war happens. You see? So how can I, once again, the beginning of this whole story today with the class is how can I fix something if I don't know how it operates? We can't. So forgive it and then you follow the instructions. First, you think, now this is what I want you to change on this. Think, never mind as you re recognize. Just recognize there's something wrong, the tension and in the distraction. And then you say, you think, never mind as you're letting go. As you're letting go, you think, never mind, let it go of that thought and relax your head. The never mind was in the wrong spot. I don't know why I did that. And the third one is bring up a smile and come back to your task and put loving kindness into it and repeat the steps and keep smiling. You know, you got to live a little, laugh a little, then you got to just take the facts a little. That's the story of, that's the glory of life. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's how it works. All right. Now, the next one is number 12. This is right effort. Just so you can see them side by side. Recognize unwholesome mind states in the mind. Release the unwholesome mind states and relax because it's telling you in the instructions in Anapanasati to release, let go of anything and then just tranquilize the bodily formation, tranquilize the mental formation. It's saying it all over the place. For us to tell you to relax means tranquilize. Some guy said, don't tell somebody to relax. They should sit up straight and be very direct like that. Mm, mm, uh, uh, mm. No, relax. You're, you're practicing to watch the mind. Relax, okay? Bring up a wholesome mind state, the smile, and then repeat making the wholesome mind state uh, the actuality. That's what you turn into the actuality. And only a uh, repetitious action retrains mind. This came out of the neuroplasticity research. They found out and confirmed absolutely the only way mind lets go of a habit and picks up a new habit and builds a new neural pathway is if you, you're doing repetition like this, repetition again and again and again, the same exact way. So I'm not being funny with you when I'm saying, when you say to Harry Smith, do it this way. And every time he comes to you, you say, do it this way. You must continue to say, do it this way. You cannot say, well, okay, let's look at it in another way. <laughs> if you do that, then it's not going to keep building the pathway. It's going to start another pathway and try to start to build that one next to it. That is about another way. And if you come back and try to say it a third way to Harry Smith, he's going to have three little pathways that are useless and are going to fade out in a few days. But if you want Harry Smith to change his habit, when you give him the new habit, he has to say, do it this way, do it this way, do it this way, do it this way. I'm sorry if it sounds like what his father always said it to him, but, <laughs> you know. But, and maybe he can figure out his own way of saying it later. But what I'm trying to tell you is the only way the neural pathways change, they watched them with the new MRI cameras. They saw them is if you're doing it repetitiously the same way. That's it, end of story. 13, continuous practice is to recognize the distraction. Never mind it as you let go. Relax the mind and tension and re-smile as you return 
and repeat as needed. That's it. That's the whole board. Let's go back to the main board with people here. Okay, so I don't know how I get back to the people there. Oh, oh, people, people. <laughs> okay, so you tell me now, how does this work for you? Does it work for you, Alexander? Um, very much. When I started TWIM a few years ago, after searching many, many years, different types of meditation methods, that's when I noticed the things that I were bothering me, dropping off and dropping off. And then I had that um, personality change where these things just didn't matter. They weren't worth the effort. So yeah, that's that's a lot of it, what it looks like to me. This, this is nonsense, isn't worth it. It's just not worth it. It's not worth it. It's, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's like, and it's like, why? Oh, what it is. My mother told me there'd be days like these. My mother told me there'd be days like these. Oh my. My mother told me there'd be days like these. Oh Lord. Oh Lord, please. That was an old rock song. And didn't you feel that way? It was just happening and happening and happening. And then somebody comes along and says, did you know you can change this? And that was what they never read a big thing about this. When the neurocognitive science did what it did that year, they didn't win the Nobel Peace Prize. They didn't, they weren't the ones that, you know, won all the prizes, but what they found was so remarkable, could change anybody. Anybody from the president of a country or a king or a queen to the poorest person on the street to a truck driver and just a sledge shoveler, it changes everything for everybody, the way you look at things. And I think it's, it's what we need in our schools. It's what, I, what we really need in our health classes for high school before they go to college. They need to have this information. Many things that happened in the United States that were happening because of depression and all kinds of things like that. But how do you crawl out from under depression if you don't understand what it is and you don't understand how it's happening, you see? These are these are um, the uh, kind of things that that they need these tools, you know. So, so anybody else? How did it work for you? Does it work for you, Rowie? Do you use the practice? Yes, indeed. I've been doing the uh, vipassana before I came to TWIM, and that's why mm -hmm. I found it so much different from uh, vipassana. It took me a long time to get it. Uh, but now more and more I'm understanding the smile and relax and the six R and to not take it personally. So it, it is working. You look much better. Your face is just really good right now. I like that. Very good, fresh face. Very happy. How about you, Dr. Weira? Are you with me? Have you been using it in your life? You're on mute. Yeah. And <laughs> How are yes. you, Dr. Weir? I think there's Look, something this you're is every on. Day. Oh, I'm sorry. There, I think I can hear you now. You can hear me? Yeah. I think so, yes. Yeah. Look, this is daily, early in the morning. Oh. As I told you before, I start three or four yeah. always yes. in the morning. Oh my and goodness. It, it was oh. really fantastic. That's <laughs> yeah, before, good. Before I, I already yes. tried to, to find another place to get another system, but not as uh, much progress as like with twim. You know? It's really fantastic. I'm glad. I'm so glad it helps you. I think older people, I think it's a wonderful thing for us to learn it. 
with older people. I wish I could have taught my mom and the people that she was at a like a, a, a home for older people and they were not happy, you know, and I wish I could have taught them, but I didn't know at the time I didn't have this information. There was no way to help them to understand that um, the, what we're doing is we're showing you how to uh, connect a communication system between your brain and your body, uh, your body and mind, and reconnect this communication system between your intentions and your mind doing, you know, following and give you the information so it works. Yeah, and when you connect it all, it really changes a person. It lightens everything up because nothing is happening to you. Everything is happening from you and you right there, they put you in control. So uh, someone said to me the other day, um, but I thought Buddhism was a really pessimistic thing, such a sad thing. And I went, ah, <laughs> who told you that? How can anybody say that this is that way? Because we're not explaining it quite clearly enough for yeah. people to pick it up. And I think a lot of it has been lost in translations back and forth. And also when you use English as a second language, you know this, that you sometimes are saying things the English speaker doesn't get it, you know, because you thought you were saying the same thing as the other, as they would say in English. The example with that is the first noble truth being changed the way they changed it. I don't I think it's an accident. I don't think it was intentional. But when you change me, I say there is suffering in life. There is suffering. That's what it means. There is suffering, period. But when you change it to life is suffering, and you think that that is the same thing, that's a mistake because of the person attempting to do this from English as a second language. And I, that's not the same thing at all. It's just the way we say chanda, we take chanda and we say it means desire. There, and he, it, and the, the thing that happened with life, all, all life is suffering, okay? They went and said the cause of life is, desi cause of suffering is desire. We said there is a cause of, of suffering. That's all we said. And he went to find it. But when he changed it to the cause of the suffering is desire. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Because then he stopped speaking. If he hadn't stopped speaking, he would have been okay maybe if he explained what that meant. <laughs> but he didn't say what that meant. And so watch what happened to the third one. When they changed the third one, they said, therefore, to have the cessation of suffering, one must desire absolutely nothing. Well, oh my gosh, what happened? Now the poor lay person is there. I shouldn't desire to have a good marriage. I shouldn't desire to have my children do well at school. I shouldn't desire, what happened? What happened? <laughs> you know? And the sangha is not hearing this mistake. This, this is where they should all come together and say, stop, let's go back and straighten this out. This is critical. Your young people are moving away from the Buddhism because of this kind of thing. It's a fracture, a, a break in the understanding, you know, but is it intentional? No, it doesn't have to be intentional. But when the largest monk in a major city in the United States tells somebody at a hospital who, system who's building a book to explain to 35,000 employees what a Buddhist is thinking when they're Buddhist and they're terminally ill and you're going to take care of that person and this is what this person grew up with and the nurse comes into the room to take care of you and she's in there starts to cry poor Dr. Weera. He, he's dying and he lived his whole life that poor man <laughs> I can 
hardly make the bed and straighten the curtains because all I can think of is this poor sweet man lived his whole life in a religion that was so horrible. Oh God. And it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, it wasn't. It was really something cool that everybody could actually learn from. And unfortunately, I couldn't stop that man from printing that because he'd already printed it when I called him and said, my gosh, what are you doing? You know, I was writing a story in the booklet for servant leadership for Buddhism and teaching him about that means that the leader of the monks or the leader in the group has to do what you want the workers to do. He has to work. He can't just sit there and point as the supervisor. He has to be working and doing what's right to teach the workers how to do what's right. So the lesson that Bonte and I gave him was the lesson about the monk who was dying of the boils. And he was with a group of monks and they had uh, sent for the Buddha to come but um, they had abandoned the monk, left him alone in his cootie, in his own uh, mess. And, uh, you know, he was dying and covered with sores. And so what did the Buddha do? Our Buddha came and went in. He just said, everybody get out and picked him up and took him to the river and cleaned him and told them to get robes and re-robe him and clean his cootie and put him in a clean bed and he stayed with him until he died. So the lesson was that's how you take care of each other in the brotherhood in the system. You don't abandon somebody if they're sick or they're not doing what you want them to anymore and put them out. It's not that way. So he had to teach them that. But see, the thing was that booklet went, 58,000 copies of that went out in Chicago. 58,000 copies of that description of Buddhism with the noble truths changed like that. And the intention was really good for what he tried to do. But who was the monk? I could never find out. It was a, high, a, a higher monk in supposedly one of the highest in Theravada in the city, obviously a foreign monk. And obviously this happened. I would like to assume that it happened because of, uh, of the fact that this was a language, English as a second language, that this got all messed up. And they just accepted whatever was, they were told in the interview and wrote a synopsis of what Buddhism was, and that went up to thousands and thousands of people, you see. And then no, no one ever did anything about it. Maybe they will now. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But this sort of slippage, this is what I call an honest slippage, like Chanda. Okay, Chanda is, means desire, but it Chanda is what I was told by a Pali scholar is a neutral word, meaning that the word you cannot say is this or this. It If it appears here, it's this. And if it appears in this paragraph, it means this, you see? So Chanda is an example of wholesome or unwholesome desire. You see, it's acceptable either way, but you can't you shouldn't be putting chanda in a Pali dictionary and saying chanda is unwholesome desire. You shouldn't do that because chanda is wholesome desire. <laughs> and we, you know, there are many monks named chanda, you know, so you shouldn't be letting that happen. There, there, one may is always after me because I have a file in my computer that has uh, about 30 or 40 of these slippages that I've collected over the years. And these slippages are very, very important to straighten out in your mind, you know? Here's another one that's really, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Vipaka, the story is like about kama, explaining kama. When you're talking about kama, you're talking about action and reaction. Action and reaction is what this is about. 
But in the newer dictionaries, and I mean, you have to go to the library to investigate this, which I did a couple different universities. The big, you know how the libraries always have one of these great big dictionaries, the old ones. And you go in the old dictionary and find this word. And um, comma uh, is, is um, wipaka, wipaka means the ripening. And then the result of the comma, the result of the action would be the fruit of the action was kamapala. But kamapala disappeared. Somewhere kamapala disappeared. So now if you ask somebody to explain, uh, you can go ask various head teachers at big temples, like in Singapore, I go to four temples and ask the four head teachers the question. Um, they will tell you, uh, Kama works like this. There's there's intention, that's the chetana, and then there's kama, that's the action, and then there's vipaka, that is the uh, fruit of the action. And I'll say no, 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 and they'll say, "What do you mean, no, no?" I'll say, "Well, because watch, chetana is my intention to grow an apple tree, and I have a seed, so I put the seed in, and that's my action to grow the tree. That's the kama." Number three, it, the tree has to grow and produce the blossoms and the apples have to come to ripening. That's vipaka. And then kamapala is the fruit I get to pick and eat the apple. So you cannot tell me there are only these three things that happen because you have to allow for the period of the vipaka to, uh, um, yeah, the the um, vipaka to happen. You can't just eliminate vipaka. I was like getting upset. And, but in the Pali classes today, in the, in, they're only using three and sometimes only two. Sometimes here's your intention at the action you do, and then there's a result. And that's all they want to say. But this is important. Well, how did it happen? When this happens, I always get curious. How did it happen? Well, in the 1960s, we had a big deal about, about karma and stuff. And we, we used to say, well, if you were walking down a street and you saw some woman hit by a car, you'd, you'd just keep walking. And then somebody would say, it's sad, that was her karma. And just keep walking. As if no matter what a person did in your life now, everything is just karma. But it's not exactly that way, is it? Hmm? Because what you just did when you walked by that person and you didn't help them just then, you actually were producing karma for yourself that was very bad for in the future. Because when you, when you get you know, in an accident and nobody stops, is known to stop for you in the future, that's what my grandmother always used to tell me. So you, whenever you hear the siren in, in the, in the um, ambulance, when we were little kids on the beach, okay, everybody stop what you're doing and say a prayer and, and help the person that is, is just gotten hurt in the ambulance. We never understood it, but the Christians have a lot more karma that they teach than you can imagine, you know, you know, um, <laughs> do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so as you sow, so shall you reap. And how you take care of your gardens, how much food you're going to get, okay? And what, you know, people say, what's it mean? It means what goes around, comes around. What you put out, you get back. All these things are karma. All of them. Yeah. So these things about uh, about the slippages, they get pretty interesting, you know, they do. So I promise you pretty soon I'll do one of those, May, I will. <laughs> Maybe I'll do one next week if I can dig it out. And I'm, I'm sort of thinking I'm missing one of these external hard drives. But the, um, the most serious one has to be uh, that the, they fooled around with the Four Noble Truths. It has to be the most serious one. And I wish that they would just come together 
uh, they don't come together for much. <laughs> you know, all the different groups of Sangha and say we're the world Sangha. You know, they don't do that very often. But it would be nice if they could just come together for the Four Noble Truths and say, this is this is right and please don't say it that way. It's kind of bad. How are you doing, Dr. Weira, though? How are you, okay? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm very happy that you get up to visit me in the morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I do that for some of the monks, but now here it's harder for me to get up at 12 midnight in Poland than it was to get up at 3 a.m. in India. I was doing fine getting up at 3 a.m., but I wasn't doing good getting up at 12 o'clock at night here. I'm still trying. Anyway, we must so I do. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else on your mind? But you looks better today. I you think so. Better, I, I How think do you feel four, today? four days of treatment, four days of medication, and I had IV the first day and four days of medicine now, and we'll see what happens. Um, I was having trouble not being able to eat after I take the medicine. So oh, today yeah. we not take the medicine. We decided eating should happen at least once a day. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I ate something today and I didn't lose it. So maybe tonight I will um, take the medicine at night instead of in the morning. She said I could take it anytime. So turn it around, yeah. try again. But We'll keep going, we'll keep trying. <laughs> so yeah, the end of this coming week, uh, we go and do a retreat. So I mean, I'm feeling better. So I just have to keep feeling better for a while, it would be helpful. <laughs> Don't make yourself too tired. I know, Don't I have to be careful. Yeah, we, we just play it a day at a time and keep going, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, okay, thank you. So I do. Hi, you. How are you doing, you? Uh, I'm very, uh, very good. I, I just like to say that the, your uh, presentation off the uh, the whiteboard. I mean, it's quite a tour de force. It, um, I think it's what needs to be told and needs to be said because it makes the uh, practice completely relevant to daily life. Um, and, and it takes it out of this being something special and different uh, to something which um, uh, is relevant. But it, it's more than that because so much of the, the um, use of mindfulness now is, is about uh, mood regulation. And uh, the mood regulation is just the starting point. That the Buddha was talking about. He said, yeah, you need, as, you, as you described with the, the breathing meditation, that's a necessary thing in order to begin to inquire. But having done that, what else is there? And, and your whiteboard exactly. just, shows, yeah. just, just yeah. shows how much more there is. And yeah. there's kind of, it's almost, like a, it's almost like an appropriation of mindfulness now. It, the word has almost become uh, meaningless in description. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah. Because it's been applied to so many things. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, I, I saw a notice in a shop uh, last week um, uh, saying, um, you know, we have mindfully arranged things, uh, you know, in the window for your, you know, for your enjoyment. <laughs> You know, it, it's become uh, a noun, it's become a verb, it, it, it's become an adjective, it's, you know, it, it's lost any sense of, of um, uh, uh, specificity around a particular practice. And I know, I know, I, 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 I know. Mean, it, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, we need to reclaim this. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 um, it's a very frustrating thing, you know, and, um, I, um, we watched the downfall of mindfulness, Bonte and I, for 20 years. We watched it diminish, 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 diminish and we, I actually watched, a, I watched a rebuttal against this uh, whole thing you're talking about by a professor in uh, the University of um, uh, Colombo, I think it was Colombo University, 
And she got up there and said, you know, this, uh, I think she was kind of outraged. I think it was the same year that somebody took the word mindfulness, had the audacity to take the word mindfulness and try to go to the courts and uh, make it a trademark, a trademark that nobody else could use uh, the word. And it was in the English court and the English court laughed them out. Thank goodness, you know, laughed them out your your courts threw it out and said this is ridiculous that you can't think that you can do this you know because it was it, and it's still it, it just it was it's they've turned it into something completely different that had nothing really to do with what it meant in the in the actual text and they get away with it you see because they're not using the text to do it well there's been a there's been a survey just published uh, um that's three or four weeks ago, uh, analyzing um, how mindfulness in schools has worked. And basically the, the uh, result of that is that it's essentially ineffective. Yeah. And, and, and you know, and there are any number of reasons for this. Um, but one of the, you know, off, but I, I have personal experience, you know, of, of teachers who are teaching it who don't do any practice and they've just done a two day, three day, you know, seminar, seminar on it to introduce it. Um, so it becomes, it, it, it just becomes a, uh, it's presented as a much more as a means of, of attempting to control behavior rather than <laughs> inform behavior. And it's, and it's bloody uh, expensive, pardon me. <laughs> it's expensive, well, it's a real racket, you know, the way they make money on this. At one point I read a one interesting article. I read an article about, um, I don't know, this was a couple years back too, actually, you know, you, this was like two, maybe three years ago, I read this article. And I read the article was about, um, you take an eight week course for mindfulness and it's $800 for this course. And it's eight weeks long. You meet on a Friday for two hours is the only time you see that teacher and that's it, you see? And they can bring you and train you. And then you're gonna be meeting together eight times and it, it's a it's a two hour meeting or something like that. And I, I was just flabbergasted at uh, we're not making a, penny teaching this you know and and these people are getting all this money but here's the here's what happened they ran they had this woman got this idea that this is outrageous and she had a bunch of people who were not socially uh, social people they needed to learn to socialize and so she took them and had them meet with her on friday to have tea and cookies and sit around and talk uh, for two hours and they got exactly the same results on the tests at the end, these two groups. And they hadn't paid a penny for it. They'd contributed money towards the cookies. <laughs> and this is, this is what we've turned ourselves over to. And this is an organization that has millions of dollars behind it. And a huge center at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and all. And it's basically the thing you need to understand. I did some research into this. There was a lot of universities in Europe and the rest of the world that came together. And uh, they stemming from the studies of all the studies, all the studies in this mindfulness development since John Kabat-Zinn have all gone toward one thing that you just cannot guess. And it doesn't have anything to do with you or me. It has to do with AI, that's all. It has to do with the development of AI, artificial intelligence and the development of robotics for mining and making money in outer space. That's what it has to do with. And I was flabbergasted. I'm thinking, you know, we really work hard to help people and to get them to get in touch with themselves and be happy, you know, like Alexander feels better, I feel better, everybody feels happier and the difference it makes in our lives. And then all of this money goes all into that and where it really goes and ends up 
is it goes and it's done some good things in medicine, but they are simple things, not they could have done so much more like you're saying. They are only touching the tip of the iceberg. That's what this means. If there's an iceberg, if you don't get it, okay, here's an iceberg, okay? And that whole thing, all that money, all that research, everything is like right here, hanging on to the tip of the iceberg and that's yeah. it. But here, here's where we're sitting in here and they don't believe there's anything in there and they don't wanna climb on the iceberg and they don't wanna to talk to you. And the reason you, you can write them and send them things and try to get somebody to listen and they don't wanna to talk to you because they figured out a money-making thing and being there, there you go. It, it breaks my heart, you know? And this well, is think, not- but I, but I think one of the things that's, you know, because I, I think from what you've just been describing on the board, uh, the last couple of sessions um you know there's a uh, you know there's, there's a very there's a very good book to be written there certainly um but also um it explains why it's only the tip of the iceberg yeah because yeah. you know you can you can cover what they're teaching in the first half chapter of a 12 chapter book Yes. And if mindfulness is to work, you need all 12 chapters. You don't need the first five paragraphs. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's it. So um, I, you know, I think it's really wonderful that um, um, I think it's just wonderful. We have to keep going with it and we, we're trying to we pinpointed it. When I think, um, you know, um, Delson, what he's doing with, if you've listened to him at all, what Delson is doing and what we're doing, we're trying to all work together to preserve what Bonte found. And we're trying, but at the same time, we're trying to reach out as much as possible, you know? And um, this, is, this, is, this is a thing that's really important. Uh, that people can get into their into their house, into their kitchen. It's not a holy thing that only certain level people can have and all that stuff. It's an interesting thing. If you have something very valuable you want to tell somebody, look, let's take the Majima Nikaya right now for just an example. I have 10 copies on the shelf over here someone bought for us from Sweden for $100 a book. Now the book doesn't cost a hundred dollars, okay? Not only that, it was printed in the highest level paper that you would find in the most expensive magazine, you know, shiny glossy paper that you can imagine. And maybe it's a good book to donate to a library, but you can buy the book for $30, you know? And then if you go over, this is even better, if you go to Sri Lanka, you can get the book for $17.50. In, and it's printed on, it's not like newspaper paper, but it's not expensive paper. But <laughs> this, I'm amazed at how I knew a woman who received a copy of that um, in, in America, a teacher, it was given to her, who it was bought in a Buddhist store in Palm Springs near Joshua Tree, California, for this teacher for $300. Now, what I'm trying to show you is something. If you have people that have so much money, they just don't know what to do with it. If you were to offer them something for free, they're never even going to look at it. Some people are, you want them, you want that group of people to be able to learn this stuff, but you want the world to be able to learn this stuff more is more important to me. But in order to spread it to the world, you have to give it to those people too. So at some point you have to have a system where there's a $400 book and a 300 and a $50 book from publishing company and $30 used book and a $10 book and a free book. But if I gave them a free book, they'd throw it out because it wasn't, you know, it didn't have an alligator on it. That's what we used to make a joke about that. If you bought a shirt 
yep, May knows what I mean. In America, if you bought a, a, a like a golf shirt like this and it had a little alligator here, you were a really classy person. But if it didn't have the little alligator on the shirt, it wasn't uh, any good. But the funny part is that the same company makes the shirt that has no alligator or has a little mouse on it. This is the same company. And when I was working with the companies uh, that get the people to work in the factories, you know, and make the clothes and everything, I was laughing all the time, you know, because I would find out that this real expensive product uh, was being made by, th by, in this, by three different companies for $10, $25, and $75 being made in the same exact company and only the little part where it said made in so such and such or the name of the company uh, is different and it's all being made in the same factory it's all <laughs> i had a coat one time i bought for 35 dollars. i went down the street for a cup of coffee and um i was in line to get like a, a sweet bun and a cup of coffee. And this woman came in and I said, you know, that's a beautiful coat. I just bought one like that. And she said, oh yes, I got it at Von Witten Teller for $400. I said, really? I had just bought mine for $35 at the end of the parking lot in a, in the, in a big coat store, a coat. <laughs> I didn't want to tell her, I wanted her to enjoy her coffee. <laughs> The world is like this. The world is not like kind of like this. It's more, it's just sometimes it's kind of feels like that, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like that. So you have to, you have to have flexibility in it, you know? <laughs> it's just something. So let's see, who else did I see? I visit Benham. How are you, Benham? Oh. Benham, how are you doing? Yeah? Um, hi, Sister Kemal. I'm good, thank you. Oh, you're smiling, that's good. I'm glad I got you smiling. <laughs> okay. How is it, where are you? I can't remember, where are you? In, I, uh, in where? I live in Iran. In Iran. Yes, how in Midalas. In, in where? In Midalis? It's a come Midalis? It's a, it's, it's a small town? No, no, or... Middle East. Middle East, near, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Beautiful people. Beautiful people in, in Iran. Persia. I remember. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was Persia. It was, that's right. And beautiful, beautiful people. And beautiful... Um, the artistry, you know, well, of course, the mosques and everything are just absolutely tremendously beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. But uh, um, yeah, adventures in mosques. I was in Washington, D.C., and I didn't know I couldn't walk in, you know, if I um, was co didn't cover my, my knees or something. I, I was only about 13 years old when that happened. And I came running out of it. <laughs> so fast I didn't mean to upset anybody but um, they were shocked I wanted to go in the building but later on I got to visit though I got to see some things really beautiful places and in Malaysia beautiful mosques in uh, in um, Kuala Lumpur some just beautiful beautiful mosques it's just gorgeous and let's see so Paul how are you doing in Scotland He knew I was going to come. Yeah? I think he's good. <laughs> I don't think he's good either right now. So Pete, who is Pete? I can't remember Pete, who he is. Pete Pie? Pie? Yeah? I'm picking on people today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we should try maybe... Uh, you need to tell me what you're most interested in. You really need to, like, if there was one thing you were curious about in Buddhism, you know, uh, you need to give me, you need to tell me. Are you ready? Close your eyes. All right. One thing that you really want to know about in Buddhism that you never, and we'll do this, you know, we'll formulate a class. Uh, 
What do you think, Rowie? What would you be interested in knowing about? I would like to know more about Nibbana, especially about Nibbana. Nibbana. Okay. <laughs> in what respect? Which, which way do you mean? Uh, one is I mean the experience, and second, how how does one achieve? There is this paradox about Nibbana. So I would like to know more about people who have achieved it in TWIM. How to how to experience yes. that? Yes, and the, what are the loopholes, drawbacks? Because it's such a paradoxical thing to want to get rid of craving. To to what to, to want to get rid of craving. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, to get rid of craving, if you, if all right, what you need to remember, and I'll give you the, just the answer to this one piece is like about craving. Um, if you in anything in the practice, if you want it, you can't get it. If, if you want it, you can't have it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've heard. I've heard, heard you. I've heard you talk about it. I've heard Bante talk yeah. about it. About it, okay, so okay, we can game. we can do one. We can do one that's pretty heavy on you. But okay, how how about um, how about let's see, Alexander? Can you think of something that you really want to know about that you never asked about? No, it's hard to think when you just put on the spot. I'm not I'm not good at that. I have to. I need to think about things a bit slower. Um, the most probably the most relevant thing I can always think of is Buddhism in everyday life, you know, going uh -huh. from the sitting position where it's all lovely. And uh, here's one for you, sister. Here's a very good one. Staying in first jhana all day long. Now I hear oh. about this, you know, I hear about it. I've heard Bhante talk a lot about it. And after I come out of a meditation, it feels good for a while, but then of course my mind goes elsewhere. So what are the tips and techniques and tricks you can give me? To stay in jhana okay, all day. That's cool. stay, okay, so staying in a jhana, that's cool. That'd be fun. All right, staying, staying in first jhana all day long. Uh, yeah, we can explain that. That's pretty cool. Okay, let's see. Benham, do you have one? Yeah, can you think of something that you want to know about that we haven't talked about? Can you think of one, Benham? Um, not actually, but I also like what Alexander told. I like to know, you know, uh, how to keep uh, this awareness and mindfulness all day long because uh, it's the same problem for me. I'm good in meditation, but after that, I cannot, you know, uh, stay as mindful as I like. So maybe how to extend this practice into everyday life, into all the time, even when we are asleep. I like to know more about this. Okay, I'll give you guys a hint before we do this, but I mean, I, 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 this is a great, great thing to get you talking like this and see, um, to, to do it like this. But I'll give you a hint on this one is really, you got to play more. <laughs> play, you see, it was like with the, when I have people here right now that I'm teaching this, I tell them, okay, today, when you go down to to this uh, you know, marketplace in the center of the city and you're gonna be around people all day and you're gonna be talking to people about different stuff and meeting people. How are you gonna take this with you and, and use it? And you have to play, you have to think like a child. How would a child discover this? Now, you guys, some of you don't, haven't done retreats so you don't have the guide papers, you know, uh, May, what you should, um, how can we do that? I don't know. Um, the 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 sutta the sutta you're really the sutta background of this you would go to MN 111 and you would look at the, at what's happening in the first jhana and uh, write down what the components are. But this is for a class. I mean, I can put it together on a little board and show you how to do it. And then you say to yourself, now can I keep these things going and take this into my life? You see, 
the reason that you can't carry first jhana and just go into life with it is because the disadvantage today is that we all have this teaching the idea of this teaching in our mind is we only do this at retreat you know or we only do it um we we put restrictions on what this is yeah that have to do outside of life we have frameworked buddhism today in something that is extracted from life and then there's life over here and what we need to do is bring this back together again and so the best thing that I could do was get with a, a three-wheeler and get in the three-wheeler and then go down to the beach and take a blanket, go down and sit by the water and play. <laughs> play like a play like a, a little kid was playing um, in, in your life. Do you remember like Alexander, think for a minute, when you became an adult, do you remember anybody having the conversation with you that you could never play again? that you should always be serious now because you're an adult and everything would be very, very serious from now on. Do you remember somebody saying it's not okay to just you know, stop what you're doing, take your shoes off and go put your foot in the nice water in the ocean and you know, build a, sit there and build a sandcastle by yourself in the evening? Silly things that are just ridiculous, why not? But who told you you could not do that? This is the thing. Who told you you could not do that? And the truth is, nobody told you you couldn't. You looked around you and nobody was, so you didn't. And now it's time to play. <laughs> and and the, to discover the, 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 the reality of the human being without the pressure of, I have to do and this is coming next and that's my responsibility. And I'll, what if you just... Um, left the house and or wherever you are and you leave you, you you put it all in a sack you pretend an imaginary bag and you put all of your worries and concerns and things you have to do and you put them all in a bag and you go like this and you hook them on the wall and you leave them there then you go out of the house you get in a taxi and say take me to the ocean or wherever you are you take me to whatever place this really nice park that you haven't been to forever and and you just sit down and you you play you do something uh, however you want to play you go you, you do something silly <laughs> absolutely silly that an adult would not do and you reclaim what what are you doing you are reclaiming the lightness of being can you put that one on the wall? You are reclaiming the lightness of being. That was a movie. They made it in, in, in over here somewhere in the Czech Republic or I don't know where it was. After It, it was a post-World War movie and it was uh, really something because people put everything away and then they just went out and did something like jump in a puddle if it's raining <laughs> my mother told me not to good then do it <laughs> jump in the puddle and splash yourself you see you know you have to do something fun go to a go to a fair and for no good reason get your face painted <laughs> I'm not kidding. You know, what happened to us is there's too much seriousness in the world. We cannot feel this anymore. I may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, day and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours, and may they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, bye everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye bye. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.